That is an impressive road victory, to say the least. Matt Gay started erecting the statue now next to Peyton Manning. Good Monday morning to you. I am Kevin Bowen. Eddie Garrison is with us. My voice sounds like Tom Allen. Maybe I'm snapping my fingers like Tom Allen in the postgame locker room here. (laughs) Uh, But no, Eddie Garrison, my voice was actually the 11th man on the field for Notre Dame on those final two snaps. That's where I... uh, that's why I left the Saturday night, so we'll gut one out here. Um, can I take a rain check on singing you happy birthday? Yes, that's fine, <laughs> as long as you remember to sing it. I know. Uh, happy belated birthday to you. We're in a little bit of a time crunch, so I want to make sure we get you know, as meaty of a normal Monday podcast as we can here. Obviously, a wild, wild final few minutes over time. etc. I just think overall, Eddie, before we get into what I liked, what I didn't like, I mean, the Colts are two and one. The Colts don't start seasons two and one. I, I think it's just the third, maybe fourth time in the last twelve or thirteen years that they've started like this. And if you look at it on paper, I mean, you beat, I would say, arguably the best quarterback you'll face all season uh, in Lamar Jackson. And you know, we talked about it certainly late last week on our morning show. The Ravens' defense was incredibly stingy at home here. Um, they allowed one touchdown in the last five games at home, which is just an astonishing stat to me. And, I mean, certainly both teams were banged up, and I think it's, it's certainly fair to say, Eddie, Baltimore had more chances to win the game than Indianapolis, but squandering those chances, I mean, the Colts aren't going to apologize after the season they just went through for that. So, you know, it was a bit sloppy. Both teams banged up. The weather obviously played into it. Who would make the fewer mistakes? And the Colts made less mistakes. And, you know, as we get into our Wednesday pod and, you know, September bleeds into October, who knows? You know, the AFC South looks very AFC South-like early in the year. And that's obviously an opportunity to maybe, you know, do something that certainly we didn't think, you know, even I, who thought seven wins was possible this season. Um, anything overall, Eddie, just stood out to you before we get into uh, what I liked? That seemed like a very un Baltimore like game. Special teams errors. Yeah, some clock management errors. Sean Harbaugh certainly yeah. doesn't. Physical, usually... mental errors. I mean, they just didn't seem sharp like we've normally seen out of a Harbaugh led Baltimore Ravens squad. Yeah, I think it's spot on. The dome team, Eddie, beat. The outdoor team. The outdoor team that had been outdoors for the first two weeks of the season. The Dome team that had yet to been outdoors. You know, when you think about all that, I mean, Shane Steichen's in-game stuff, we'll, we'll, we'll get to a Shane Steichen attribute that I think stood out from really over the weekend, uh, but obviously had a big role in in Sunday. So, um, again, 2-1. and one. It, it seems like with how the Colts have played over these 12 quarters, they deserve to be 2-1. and one. Like, I know that Baltimore easily could have gone the other way. Jacksonville, probably not to the degree of Baltimore, could have gone the other way, but certainly you had some moments there. It just feels like, though, this team does deserve to be 2-1 and one here after the start. And now, you know, we'll look closer at this on Wednesday, but, I mean, Eddie, there's probably a lot of people that would look at Sunday and think that that's a schedule win for the Colts. I mean, the Rams are in Cincinnati tonight, then they've got to fly home. They're going to have a very short week and then fly back across the country and play a 10 a.m. local time kick. That's certainly not a favorable back-to-back for the Rams here, and obviously they're dealing with their injury situation. So let's get into what I liked, and how do you not start with Matt Gay? It's um, Eddie, it has to be one of the greatest games in NFL history for a kicker, and I know the stat indicates that of you know no one's made four 50 yard plus field goals in a game but let's paint more of the picture than that all those kicks came outdoors in less than ideal weather all those kicks came in the second half and or end of regulation and or overtime of a one possession game this is not a dude that booted whatever four 50 yard plus field goals and a three score win this the game was one possession all throughout every single kick it seemed like would have been good in those arena football league uprights I mean like just right down the middle every single time and then lastly and Matt Gay would probably need some shoe serum to answer this don't you think that one means more knowing it's Justin Tucker on the other sideline 
I mean, kickers are in their own little world. You know, they chat before the game, chat after the game. I, I would think that would mean more. And so when you add all of that up, man, I mean, what a historically incredible performance from him. And he's giving the Colts something that they wouldn't even thought of trying in recent years. Mm-hmm. You know, those distance kicks outdoors. Um, and it, it, it's such an added weapon. You know, I said this back in March, Eddie, when the signing happened. I was good with it. The caveat I had was it can't hinder you from other moves. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't want to you see, sit there and, oh, well, I gave an extra million to Matt Gary, so I can't give an extra million to a whiteout you know, or something along those lines. But what the Colts did, and major credit to Chris Ballard for this, he took a position that had not been a recent strength and turned it into a strength and then added something to the football team by the long-distance ability. So just just an absurd, absurd performance from Matt Gay. And, um, yeah, he deserves the game ball. He deserves all the regular recognition that, you know, obviously AFC Special Teams Player of the Week, all that stuff. Yep, I thought he was magnificent when they needed him to be, um, and I it, it's wild to think about week one, we came on the podcast after the Colts lost to Jacksonville, questioning Shane Steichen and not utilizing the most expensive kicker in the National Football League, and then just two weeks later, he's the guy who's winning you a football game. Yeah, and Eddie, again, think back to recent history. I looked this up after the game. Matt Gay just made four field goals from at least 53 yards in the game. Three from 53, one from 54. I thought to myself, how many games do I have to go back to get to where the Colts have made four field goals from at least 53 yards? So if you go back starting last week and add up all the games. Just in a season? Well, unfortunately, you got to combine seasons. Yeah. You got to go back to when Andrew Luck was quarterbacking this team in December 2018 for the last time in 60 some games or however many games that has happened from then to now. Hell, it's probably more than that. That you go back to to find, you know, I think Vinatieri had one in 2019. I think McLaughlin might have had, you know, one or two. Like, I mean, this just uh, it happens maybe once in a season for the Colts, and it happened four times yesterday so um absolutely outstanding by matt gay uh the second thing you liked about the game and i think this is where the game really changed was baltimore's second possession first drive they go down 12 plays 80 yards take six and a half and they pretty much did anything they wanted and converted a couple third downs uh the colts have to punt on their following drive and baltimore is about to threaten to score again and then on the third play it's a screen pass to Kenyon drake He's working his way down the Colts' side of the field, and Juju Brents comes up with a forced fumble on the tackle. Colts recover. Next thing you know, I think that is where the game really changed because that's when the wheels started to fall off in the first half for Baltimore. Yeah, I mean, I I could not agree more. We had Juju Brents on our morning show earlier today. We'll play that coming up on the Wednesday pod here this week for you guys if you missed it. I mean, Eddie, I think our listeners know I'm such a big believer in game flow, how momentum can change, and I don't want to lose sight of this play. You know, the other kind of sneaky play was late first half, Eddie, when Quint Nelson and Michael Pittman kept that fumble alive a little bit. Nelson certainly kept it alive mm-hmm. when Minshew got sacked and stripped by Hamilton, and then Pittman uh, pounced on it. That was three points at least right there at the end of the first half. But, <clears throat> I mean, you just laid it out. You got sliced and diced on that opening drive. Your offense quickly goes, was it three and out to start the game? It seemed like a very quick, quick drive. Uh, yeah, I think you got behind the chains and and, and had to punt there. Mm-hmm. And then... Got a first down with Zach Moss on the big oh, run on the to first start. play of the game. And then, yeah. And, yeah, and then sold out. Um, and then, you know, here's Kenyon Drake in the open field, and I'm like, oh my gosh, is this really happening? I never saw him do that at Colts training camp. And out of nowhere comes Brents to have the wherewithal to go for the strip and then to get on the ball. I mean, it's rare to see guys strip and recover, both you know, on the same play. Just such a heady, heady play by Brents. Um, and I thought, if he doesn't make that play, I don't know, Eddie, 10, 14 down at that point, 
and then you're putting your O-line in an even worse position. If you know, you've got any other empty drives and Baltimore's offense feels like it's really clicking, I mean, that game could have got away from you, yeah. frankly. And I know that might be a little bit of, yeah, Kevin, you have no idea what you're talking about, but... I mean, those are just those plays early on in the game, especially away from home, where you need something. You need some sort of injection of life, some sort of hope. And Prince did exactly that. And and Eddie, I thought he had a really nice debut. I thought he brought some physicality. I mean, when he tackled, it was he kind of lived up to the frame. And you don't typically see that from corners always, even even the bigger corners. Mm-hmm. Big play on Mark Andrews there in the third quarter on a third down. They trusted him in coverage, so. I think Juju Brents deserves to be individually mentioned like this. He played 53 of 72 snaps in place for Daryl Baker Jr., which we'll get to here in just a second. And I mean, for a guy that you know didn't even play week one or week two, to play, to look like that in a variety of ways, to make a game-changing play, it's a great debut, and what a great opportunity he now has to entrench himself as a mainstay. You know, with this uh, with this corner group moving forward. Um, one thing I want to add here in the what you like that you failed to put on here, Michael Pittman Jr. You know, it's funny you say that. I just wrote a hits and misses pieces, uh, hits and misses piece for our website, and I singled out Moss and Pittman Jr. You know, for two different things. Moss, how about the touchdown catch he had? I yeah. feel like we kind of forget that play. I mean, that's a third down, over-the-shoulder basket catch for a guy that doesn't catch balls. Mm-hmm. And then he has 30 carries. I mean, 30 carries for a running back nowadays? That is a massive, massive number. Um, so, yeah, Moss there for the workload. And then, obviously, Pittman's catch. I mean, the dude, I mean, dude's pulling his helmet, gets knocked off. I think it's a bigger catch than the San Francisco game. San Francisco kind of iced it at that point of overtime. You still needed to go win the game at that point. Um, yeah, extraordinary play by Pittman, and you know, typical him. He just he does all the dirty work. He loves those elements. Um, that's why I've always you know been a big fan of him and a b- big proponent of not a pretty boy USC grad retaining him. Yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for saving my voice from from saying that there. But uh, yeah, it, it, exactly that. I know it, it was not a good day for the offense. Obviously, the passing offense in particular was really stymied. But I thought a nice job by those two individuals offensively. And then uh, limiting the mistakes, that's the final part of this that you liked about the game, and I will agree with you. They had six turn, uh, six penalties, no turnovers, but I didn't feel like any of those six penalties were back-breaking penalties, whether it was a defensive holding, an illegal contact defensively, or a pass interference. Um, and the same like on the offensive side, I can't remember like any big Holding penalties that negated any big plays. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the Braden Smith false start, but I, yeah, I don't remember. Obviously, got away with the EJ Speed one there late, but um, what? I I just thought overall, no. <laughs> when the backup quarterback gets in there, Eddie, what does that usually indicate? Go find the defense that plays that backup quarterback in fantasy and start that defense. Mm-hmm. And you didn't turn it over. Yes, you had the safety. And I blame McKenzie so much for putting the offense in that situation. Yes. I mean, honestly, Eddie, indirectly, him stepping out of the end zone was the best thing that could happen in that moment. If he doesn't step out of the end zone, and let's just say the ball, you know, he throws it incomplete on that third and 11. The two-minute warning probably happens right there. Then you're punting from your own end zone. With one timeout. And Rigoberto Sanchez doesn't boom a 62-yarder like he did on the onside kick punt. And obviously, with him stepping out of the end zone, the clock was 2.03, I believe. He booms the punt. Zay Flowers, and this is where John Harbaugh made a huge mistake. They forgot the clock had bumped the back up above two minutes. Zay Flowers calls for a fair catch, when in reality, he should have just run around for four seconds, and then gone, which he easily could have done, and then gone down. I mean, that, I mean, that saved 40 seconds, and then Baltimore gets the penalty on that drive, and boom, now the Colts get the clock back, or get the ball back, and they have plenty of time to get into Matt Gay field goal range. So that, that sequence was huge. But again, for them, you know, when you think about weather plays, ball security, errant snaps, I had props. a friend tell me, by the way, that um, Minshew should have just took the snap, set the ball on the ground, and let Baltimore recover into the end zone and go up eight. Colts get the ball back with the one timeout, two minute warning, and then. Have to go down and score a touchdown and go for two. Yeah, my only thought there is I think Baltimore might have gone for two. 
yeah, try and win the game. You know, try and get it to nine. I think you're, you, I think you're starting to see that a little bit more with a dual threat guy like, oh yeah, like Lamar. Yeah, I, th- that that thought actually did run through my head there. Um, gosh, what a crazy sequence! <laughs> the end of the game is just wild. Um, but I thought weather plays you out weathered them. Like mm-hmm. you, 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 you know, weathered you, the storm better. Yeah, yeah. You didn't have, and I, I know it wasn't awful, awful weather, but still, um, I thought you had less than than them there. Um, let's save Eddie the accountability aspect to Steichen for Wednesday. You know, that's something that I also want to mention. I, I mentioned that in in what I wrote right after the game, but he sent a pretty clear message to this locker room by what he's done with Deion Jackson and now what he did with Daryl Baker Jr. And I don't want to lose sight of that. Yeah. And it's September, and those are two former undrafted guys. It's not like you're benching, you know, Shaq Leonard or Braden Smith or whatever, somebody of note. But I think you're seeing a little bit of a different approach when it comes to that aspect to it there. So, um, yeah, I thought, you know, from a how you win a game like that, if it's ugly, you have fewer mistakes than your opponent. And that's clearly what the Colts had. You just hinted at it a couple minutes ago about what you didn't like, the passing offense. Yeah, I mean, when you boil down the numbers, yards per attempt, yards per drop back, just awful, um, really, really poor. And again, it's not like I expected a ton, but you would like a little bit more from an in-rhythm standpoint. The aspect of the passing offense, Eddie, I thought the biggest issue was was just how many free rushers and how many times Kyle Hamilton got clean shots on Gardner Minshew. I mean, Eddie, Gardner Minshew's lucky he didn't get knocked out of that game. And I know he got um, like nicked up a little bit because he got hit once and he right. was pointing to his chest. Right in the end of a drive, yeah. if I remember correctly. Yeah. I, mean, I, I believe that was in the fourth quarter, too. Maybe so like, third. You know, misidentification. Um, I mean, Baltimore's going to disguise, and there's going to be moments where free rushers happen. And when that happens, Eddie, you got to identify hot read, get rid of it, or just be aware. And that last part to me was shocking. Like, I didn't feel like Minchu was aware that Hamilton was free several of those of the three sacks. Like, I mean, all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, yeah, he's got to see that and he'll just throw it away. I'm like, oh, wait, he's not throwing it away. Oh, damn, he just got laid out. I was talking to Bill Brooks about that during the game yesterday, and he said, now, Minshew in the back, in this case it was Moss, just have to like do a better job at identifying. But at the same time, they were also he was also wondering, you know, if he moves Moss over to his right hip, where Hamilton's lined over the on the right side of the field, if they bring the safety from the other side. Because Baltimore does the exotic blitzing where they show six and only bring four. And so you don't know where that fourth one's coming from. And if they moved Zach Moss to the other side, he thinks that the other safety from the other side was going to blitz instead, or the slot corner. Interesting. Yeah, and, you know, again, Baltimore having free rushers and you not having maybe enough hats to pick up that, that's going to happen. But when it does happen, it's the old Peyton Manning adage of when you're in a bad play, don't make it worse. You know, make sure the bad play is just a bad play. And, I mean, he held on to it a couple times, but as we mentioned earlier, if Nelson doesn't make the big effort play and Pittman falls on it, that could be the difference in the game. So I just thought really poor from Minshew in that area. Minshew and or communication up front. Um, But, yeah, passing offense in general you just need more of. Kind of a quiet day for the tight ends. You know, Pierce had the one play that late, you know, was a great play by the DB. But, you know, you would like for Pierce to haul that in. I do think Josh Downs just steady, typical steady Eddie, out of Josh Downs, pretty, pretty methodical in making sure you're kind of staying ahead of the chains, and you know, pretty much once you got in the third and long, it was ugly. How many of his catches went for a first down? It seemed like every one. Yeah, what do you have? Eight or nine for the game? I mean, certainly. I think he had eight catches on twelve targets. Yeah, and if nothing else, Eddie, I thought what he was doing, you know, eight for fifty-seven, so it wasn't a huge average. Seven point one was the average, as long as it was twelve. I just thought he allowed you to get into manageable situations. That too, like yeah. just and that is so important when you're playing that defense. I mean, if you look at it early on, I didn't chart it for the whole game, but early on, it was literally like if it's third and long, you're screwed. Like they weren't getting them; they're getting sacked. If it was third and short, they were converting. I mean, it, it had that feel for quite a while, which you know I know is probably the normal trend to it. Ready for Twitter questions? Yes, let's hop in. 
Scott wants to know if it's wrong to love Shane Steichen already. <laughs> Is this where I insert my, who am I to tell you who to love? Um, <laughs> no, yeah, I, I think it's fine to to love him. I mean, I, I, I'm a nerd sucker for the game management stuff. I love the timeout games that he's played. I think they actually are meaningful. I mean, again, my voice would indicate Notre Dame, Ohio State mattered. I would think timeouts mattered in that moment. Yeah. Um, I would say Colts. Personnel grouping mattered for sure. Very. Uh, Colts and Ravens. I mean, it, it mattered as well. I mean, timeouts were huge. And even if like the, that, that happens in the first half and you're not able to you know maybe see the ramifications of it, uh, if you continue to do that, what you're doing now is making the team prepare more, making the opponent think a little bit more. And the more an opponent thinks, I think the more likely they are to make a mental mistake or – they're not, you know, playing from from advantage like that, which I think is huge. So, you know, again, I I was a fan of the hire. I I, I loved the quarterback background to it. Um, I you know I felt like it was more Sirianni than Reich in terms of his emotion and that being able to resonate. But the question I did have was just in game management. You know, would you is there enough on your plate? Is there too much on your plate to yeah. where you can't make those sorts of little, you know, kind of detail type plays in there? And the guy that, you know, why have the Ravens, Steelers, and Patriots been so damn consistent for the last decade plus? They have a CEO of a head coach. I mean, yeah, I mean, you got you got a manager that on game day and throughout the week can you know figure out what needs attention and and, and be there. Well, on Sunday, you out managed the CEO, and brilliant. I mean, by Sykin and not brilliant by John Harbaugh. Colt Maniac says, between Lamar Jackson's poor decisions and the refs that missed the call against EJ Speed at the end in overtime, out of those two, which one would get the MVP award for what kept the Colts in the game or helped them win? Yeah, I, I mean... I mean, it was certainly the speed penalty. Wasn't there a face mask that would have been offsetting to the, the Colts got away with? I can't remember. Thinking that, or I don't know. But, I mean, you could counter and say, you know, when Pittman made the catch, you know, that should have been something, illegal hands to the face or, you know, face mask or something on that end. You know, I think I can sit back and go back to what I said earlier. Baltimore had more chances to put that game away than Indy. Yeah. But... You also have to create. You also have to put yourself in position to when luck arises or good breaks happen, you can take advantage of that. Like the Colts didn't give up seventy. The Colts didn't, you know, lose by twenty to a Houston team. I mean, like when those moments do happen, are you still in the competitive standpoint of a game to where you are able to make those decisions be impactful? And, you know, create consequences for the opponent. So um, I think the Colts deserve credit for that. I mean, Lamar had, I guess, some poor decisions. But, you know, frankly, if I'm going to boil it down to it, I mean, probably. I mean, where did that speed pass interference occur? I mean, that would have been, what, 15 yards? I mean, hell, at that point, they would have been really close to Tucker range. Um, You know, maybe needing a few more yards to feel really comfortable about it. But. With Justin Tucker, if you would have given him a second chance, you probably would have paid for it. Yeah. Did you think that sixty one yarder was in? I thought it was in. Yeah. I was I was really surprised when it fell short. Yeah. Really, really surprised. Yeah, me too. I thought it was I thought it was going through for sure. Mm-hmm. Um in Jonito or in Honito, I always forget which one it is, if it's a J or an H. Honito. Honito, is that what we go with? I don't know. I just sounded decent with my voice. All righty. Is it just me, or did Lamar Jackson stop testing the Colts downfield in the second half? If that's the case, when was the last time the Colts secondary would be considered a strength of the game? Yeah, I did think it was a nice day for the secondary. Certainly kept Zay Flowers in front of them, which was important, and I thought tackled well, which was a key as well. I don't think they allowed a play of more than 20 yards. Technically, the Kenyon Drake one, I think, fell short of that because it was a turnover. They allowed three. Of more than 20? Yeah. Ooh. There was the Kenyon Drake. Yeah. Mark Andrews had a 20-yard catch. I, I, more than 20, I guess. Like oh, okay. And then Likely had 20 as well. But both of Andrews and Likely's came on their touchdown drive. Yeah. 
And I think they shut down Andrews in the second half, only two receptions for uh, 10 yards. Yeah, Juju had that big play on third down. So, I mean, you think about it. If you had told somebody at the start of the day, you know, Ravens will have one play of 21 yards or longer, and that one play is a turnover. I mean, obviously, you would sign up for you. I don't know if Baltimore is worried about their O line holding up. I mean, they had a couple backups in there. And so, you know, there were moments in pass protection where it wasn't pretty, pretty. You know, a guy that I think, you know, deserves a little bit of credit, we haven't talked to him a ton, um, is Dallas Flowers. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I think teams haven't tested him too, too much there. Um, yeah. I, I I feel like he has been pretty solid here early on in the season. Um, but, yeah, I think it was more of just a worried about your defensive front, worried about your offensive line mate holding up against the Colts, Colts defensive front. How about the start to the season for Quiddy Pay as well? Three consecutive games with the sack. Yeah, and then, you know, Ebu Kam on the other side taking advantage of, yes. you know, the favorable matchups he's had with the backup in each of those three games. So, again, for a third straight week, man, your defensive front has had an on vantage or an on paper advantage and is big time uh, taking advantage of that. Jay, what did Gardner Minshew do to win the game, that Anth- this game that Anthony Rich- Richardson can't do? I have friends saying start Minshew because he's a winner. I think we would have won this game easily with Richardson at quarterback considering how well the defense played in the obvious record-setting kick game. I think Colts fans are forgetting this season is about winning. It's about evaluating Anthony Richardson and the future. What are your thoughts? Love the podcast and thank you. <laughs> Who was that from? Jay. Jay. Thank you, Jay, for it. I, I mean, let's not get too carried away with Gardner. I, I, you know, I guess there's no way for me to say this, Andy. I almost called you Andy. Eddie, without disparaging him, but I'm pretty sure he had lost like nine of his last ten starts entering Sunday. I mean, something along. I mean, he's eight and sixteen as a starter. Again, he's he's a he's a high end backup, but I think it's absolutely foolish to commit to him in a starting manner, short-term or long-term. I mean, at some point, you're going to need more from your offense. I mean, you're you're playing with fire with how much pressure has been on your defense here. Um, I mean, he didn't turn it over. If you want to boil it down to one thing he did that, you know, maybe Richardson might struggle with. You know, we obviously haven't seen Richardson play. You know, big-time, you know, games yet, or at least 60 minutes of games outside of the opener. So, I mean, your passing offense was non-existent. You had to rely so much. I mean, Zach Moss carried it 30 times for a reason. You know, it's because you were struggling. So much throwing it. So, yeah, e- even in the short term, I would not agree with playing Minshew at all. Daniel wants to know if this win changes the ceiling of this team. Feels like something special could be brewing. Zach Moss has been excellent, and with Jonathan Taylor set to come back soon, if Moss continues to play well, does he keep his RB1 role? No, no, he, no. He, let's not overreact to two games of Zach Moss. Um, you know, he can spell them, but... I think it's been more than just two games, KB. I think if you even look back to last year, how he finished the season, I sure. think you should even look at it That is fair. back that far because... Yeah. What what he averaging carry four point one? So I think he's averaging around four point eight now, um, right. since he's been the the RB one for the Colts. Right, and I know not everything is yards per carry. Even Taylor's numbers would be you know in his career is five point three. So yeah, I mean Taylor, when healthy, if healthy, if he's playing for the Colts, et cetera, et cetera, should be the starter. Moss can spell him, and it, you know you bring a little power guy in to spell after Taylor's kind of done his thing for a couple series. That could be really beneficial. To your run game, you know, does this win change the ceiling of the season? This is where I'm always tor- torn, Eddie, with like September, good and bad. Of like, you know, the 2018 season, you started one and five, and like this time last year, the Colts just beat the Chiefs. You know, were we all saying in week three last year, like, man, as a team, they can, they they could surprise some people. Like, mm-hmm. all they need to do is get one win, and then do you look out at the end of the year and say, well, the Chiefs had. A million mistakes in that game, and the Colts were a four-win football team. Like I don't think the same exiting Sunday with that one, but you know if Justin Tucker makes the sixty-one yarder. Do we react to one and two the same way where we are reacting to two and one? I'm always torn on this. Like I walk out of Notre Dame Stadium on Saturday and think, God, Notre Dame, man, chances of making the playoffs. I mean, they have to run the table, and I'm thinking six inches is the difference in that. Like, and part of this is just sports, you know. Part of this is just like, especially college football, where the margin of error is so so slim. I would say this about the Colts right now: through 
12 quarters, they've shown me more than I thought. And again, I was a seven win guy, but through 12 quarters, I think there's a little bit more there than I thought. So, I mean, if I were seven wins, do I readjust that to like eight or nine? If you would like give me the choice, maybe, um, Again, I continue to think the quarterback slate is not very good, and we'll see if Derek Carr is even playing against this team. You know, in a in a couple of weeks after his injury, and I you know, brought up the Rams earlier. That's kind of a weird scheduling quirk with um, how that game looks on Sunday. And you're gonna ha- have a couple of big divisional games. I mean, you know, going down and beating Jacksonville, you don't want to call it a must, but obviously it'll be difficult no matter what happens to come back from you know beating Jacksonville, potentially being swept by Jacksonville. Never know. I mean, they just lost to Houston. Sure, um, at home and got their butts kicked. Right, and, and and again, like that's what we all react to. I mean, Trevor Lawrence in Week One, it was like, oh my gosh, he looked like a top five quarterback, and now it's like, oh, it's the Jacksonville we saw for you know the first two months of last season before they turned it around there late in the year. So, I think again through twelve quarters, there's reasons that this season could be better than I think a lot of people thought. I'm still like a little bit like I'm not ready to go just there yet. Um, Because, I mean, yes, the Colts have been banged up, but I think you could make the argument that their opponents have had probably bigger injury situations, certainly the last two games. Um, I mean, you faced a backup left tackle each of the first three games. I mean, that is a huge issue for... Colts opponents, I mean, Baltimore. I mean, Eddie, they knew all seven of their inactives on Friday. I mean, when does that ever happen? And not to mention they had already lost J.K. Dobbins, and then they lost Gus Edwards during the game, and David Jabba during the game, and the Colts, you know, from a health standpoint, you know, they stayed pretty darn healthy. So, um, again, I think there are reasons to be optimistic and think, boy, this is a start to the year that's better than it has been, which is undoubtedly true. Um, and the AFC South is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. But... I don't know if I'm going to say the ceiling now is all of a sudden like 9 or 10. Again, I thought 7. Maybe I go a step higher, but I don't know if I'm ready to say that just just yet. To me, when I'm comparing last year to this year, we talk about turnovers. And I think a part of the game that we haven't or don't focus on enough is time of possession. That Because the Colts defense is on the field less right now than it was last year. And we're seeing how a fresh defense underneath Gus Bradley is really good, especially against the run. And I think that's part of the reason that they're more successful this year. They're limiting the turnovers. The defense isn't on the field as much. And they've been able to force some extra turnovers this year, too. Yeah, and and I'd say one last thing I'll add. You know, we still have yet to really see Anthony Richardson. I mean, he's played five quarters. So, like, yeah. and and you can say that good, or you can say that bad. I mean, how does he react to like his first kind of injury ish situation? You know, all of those things are such curiosities. And the beauty of the NFL season is it can be so week to week, and it's also seventeen of them. So, you know, what barely over a third of the way, or a sixth of the way, excuse me, through the season. Uh, Craig wants to apologize about the Notre Dame loss on Saturday to Ohio State first and foremost. Can I vent about the Irish? Go for it. It's the worst coaching decision I have ever seen in a game. Um, I don't understand. After a timeout, 10 guys on the field. Then after Ohio State not, subs. Not once. Twice. Twice. Then Ohio State subs. So you can sub. We saw that yesterday, the subbing you know, fiasco between the Colts and Ravens. And Marcus Freeman knew there were 10 out there. You're telling me you'd rather have 10 defending a yard than 11 defending a yard and a half? Take the penalty. Tell one of your corners to run off sides. Run on the field for all I care. Get unsportsmanlike. Half the distance to the goal. Do whatever you need to. They were it is, terrific it is stopping the dumbest. Run. It is the I love Marcus Freeman. I think he's done a lot of good for the program. I'm excited about the future. I think it's the dumbest coaching decision considering the moment that I've ever seen. He knew they had 10. There was a lot of question marks around the coaching decisions in that one for me personally. I'm going to boil over if we keep on this any further. Yeah. Um, so Craig said first, sorry about the Notre Dame loss on mm-hmm. Saturday. Thank you, Craig. Uh, he, but he says, great win by the Colts, though. Uh, the defense really got to Lamar Jackson. However, what's up with all the mental mistakes? Braden Smith was awful with the false start penalties. Isaiah McKenzie should no longer return punts if he can't fair catch the ball. And while Gardner Minshew is amazingly tough, 
he had some critical mental errors, stepping out of bounds, taking three sacks when he could have thrown the ball away. Their mental errors almost cost them the game. By the way, my game is worth every freaking penny. It shows what a quality kicker can mean when most games are decided by less than seven points. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. You know, he lists out all the mental mistakes. Again, men choose the one that I've kind of led to of just like, man, I mean, that one, like, just feeling that, having better pocket awareness. I mean, those elements on the road, you know, you're going to have some mental mistakes. So, you know, I'm not going to act like it should be some clean, clean sheet. But again, Minshew with 24 starts. McKenzie, a six or seven year vet. And I know he said after the game, you know, the ball was kind of wobbling and he was uncertain about fielding it there. You know, sometimes you just got to step up and try and catch it. I mean, that, that, I mean, that could have sealed the game. Arguably should have sealed the game. 13 yard mistake, put your offense in a horrific position. Just brutal. Um, we'll skip over C. Daly and Trevor's because Trevor's we kind of answered a little bit earlier regarding Kyle Hamilton and just a little bit more with Braden Smith just now. Uh, Daly, C. Daly's will pertain to Wednesday's podcast, but cool. uh, Shane Steichen and, and accountability. Um, two questions left. Eddie, what do you think is better from Anthony Richardson's development long term? Adding an elite playmaker with a high draft pick or pushing for a playoff berth in year one? Yeah, Eddie, I think this will be a popular topic this week and moving forward. I, I'm going to stand by finding the playmaker moving forward. You know, when you use the phrase pushing for a playoff berth, so that means you don't get in, right? But it means Correct. you've won seven to, time, seven it would to be nine like games. The Pacers of this past season. So you, you're, you show promise. Right. You're but, right there. You get, and then all of a sudden you start to get injuries pile up a little bit. And next thing you know, you realize, hey, Maybe it's not the right time for us to push. But I would guess you're drafting a lot later than the Pacers. You know, just did. Pacers drafted, what, Walker at seven overall? Yeah. Um, eight, technically. Technically eight. <laughs> um, you'd be drafting a little bit more middle of round one. I lost money on that, and it irks me. <laughs> that is brutal. You know, Eddie, I think in the immediate aftermath of a win like yesterday, I mean, the Colts don't win, haven't won back-to-back road games very often, let alone against an MVP-style quarterback in Lamar Jackson. So I understand totally all the celebration, all the fandom, all of that. Um, I guess I'm probably providing a little bit more of like, okay, if you look down the road two to three years, you know, seven and nine versus, or whatever, let's say eight and nine versus five and 12 this season. Those three wins, those create three much better Monday mornings throughout the fall. But what does eight to nine positions do each round in a draft to you? Obviously, it's not going to be the end-all, be-all. There's plenty of picks you can point to that were taken you know, later in a round, and those guys work out better than guys drafted above them. But you know, are you missing out on, on an opportunity to get that bigger fish? whether it is Marvin Harrison Jr. or whoever that is. Because, again, I look at it from a how do you create a window of six, eight to ten years, not a window of what gives you this kind of instant gratification right here, right now. Now, certainly if you're pushing for a playoff berth, that obviously would mean Anthony Richardson's playing pretty good football. Mm -hmm. So that would be very, very encouraging. I don't want it to come at an expense, though, of, you know, possibly not getting the type of skill player that you would want that's that's the really j- difficult thing and again you can point to where whatever justin jefferson was drafted versus and i'm trying to think of who else was drafted around that draft certainly justin blackman was a top 10 pick out wide out just because you have top 10 pick doesn't mean it's a guarantee right to hit for sure um but i think there's more likelihood that you do have the opportunity to hit on that, or you can help you out in trade situations from trading up or trading back. You know, those sorts of things are other big factors in why having a higher draft pick matters. I mean, it's such a hard line to decipher because the winning part of this is so important, not only for just Richardson, but for just the overall morale and culture that Shane Steichen is trying to build. That is certainly true. Yet you need to build around your quarterback at the same time and wide receivers are one of the more coveted, if not the most coveted position outside of quarterback offensively. And you've got some freak athletes coming out of this draft that'll be in the top half and 
Marvin Harrison Jr. and Emeka Abuka, both out of Ohio State. So, I mean, it's such a hard thing to grasp if you're yeah. Shane Steichen. Yeah, and, and it's, it's difficult to even answer. I mean, I'm, you know, I think I said at the start of the year, the most important thing is Richardson's development and finding that major piece for him moving mm-hmm. forward. Now, again, the major piece doesn't have to come at four overall or, right. you know, wherever. Justin Jefferson was drafted where? Like, you can obviously find guys at different points, um, but I do think the, the chances are higher. You know, if you do get that better pick, and again, it helps you out in future rounds. You know, moving and wheeling and dealing, those sorts of things. But at the same time, for a new head coach, to your point, Eddie, and you're trying to create a new culture, you, you don't want losing to become the norm. You don't Especially. want that to be an accepted thing. And that's what I'm curious about on Sunday. And, and, and let's actually just end there, if you don't mind, Eddie. We can, you know, we can say the other questions. I do for, have one more thing for you for Wednesday. But what? does Sunday do for you moving forward just like even though you caught some breaks you still have a winning feeling for six days and the next time you get in a fourth quarter moment do you look back on Baltimore and do you say hey we won there like we made some plays late this is a really bad fourth quarter team last year it's a really bad fourth quarter team in the first two weeks of the season does what you did on Sunday, does that lead to a little bit of like, hey, we can do this now. We're under new leadership. That That's a question that I have exiting Sunday. What type of guy were you in a group project? <laughs> uh-huh. Were you the one that sat back and took the A, or were you one of the vocal leaders in, uh, or did you just yeah, do your I, job? I, yeah, I'd say maybe a little bit more than just doing my job. I mean, if we had some slackers, you try to make up for that. But at the same time, you got to know your role. If you're not the smartest in the group, why would you try and go above and beyond? So uh, what you're saying is you, you were more uh, Drew Ogletree than Mo Alley Cox. Ah, uh, sure. Sure, sure, sure. You know, Mo plays the least amount of snaps out of the Colts' tight ends, and he tries to put us on blast, KB. <laughs> I did see that, and I and I d- did respond to Mo. For those that missed it, all of us here at the radio station picked the Ravens to beat the Colts, and so Mo got that graphic and you know had a funny emoji response to that. Um, yes, we deserve to eat crow. Max Bowen, by the way, picked the Colts. Yeah. So Max Bowen right now two and one on his picks this this season. Um, so yes, deserve as well. Part of me did want to respond, Eddie. No acknowledgement for the correct picks in week one and week two. (laughs) And I do love that this is more a shot at Ryan Day than anything. But, like, you know, you hear from coaches or even players. That was so passionate, too, by Day after the game. Yeah, and and I know Mo's just having a little fun with it. And I'll make sure to say something to him when the locker room opens up on Wednesday. But, like, you hear from coaches all the time, we don't listen to the noise. We don't block it all out. But, boy, when that noise all of a sudden goes your way, you sure as hell listen to it, and you want everybody, even if that noise is 89-year-old Lou Holtz, who is like my you know, grandpa at Christmas. You just ignore him the whole time. So Don't forget your lunchbox, KB. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, all right, he is Eddie Garrison. I'm Kevin Bowen. Apologies for the voice. Trying to gut it out here on this Monday. Way too much unnecessary yelling. I thought it was necessary at the time. Way too much yelling in South Bend on Sunday. Um, Wednesday afternoon work. Works for me. Cool. I think that's what we'll do. I might have to adjust that a little bit, but for now, let's um, let's keep it that way. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Kevin's Corner. Have a great week.